So Dr. Jamila Satar is actually our consultant hematologist and also she is a former head of uh, service for the hematology service in Malaysia. And she is actually responsible for the care of uh, patients with thalassemia, hemophilia, thrombosis and bleeding disorder. She has done a lot of work in these areas and she has been instrumental in developing the national thalassemia and hemophilia programs and also guidelines. And this has definitely made a huge impact in the patients in these uh, areas. As well, um, she is uh, actually leading the patient blood management and also the bloodless medicine work in Malaysia. And she is also the president of the society, Malaysian Society of Patient Blood Management. So um, with no further ado, I would like to call upon Dr. Jamila Satar to actually present her talk. Yep. Uh, like, firstly, I would like to say that as clinicians, it is our duty not only to um, um, treat our patients uh, with utmost uh, care, but we are also, um, our duty is also to educate our trainee specialists as well as patients, so that um, with education, we would all work together to improve patient outcomes. Um, what I'll do is I'll begin with um, touching on the, a brief history of bloodless medicine and surgery in Malaysia. This go back to more than 30 years ago. It started in 1994 with the first bloodless triple coronary bypass heart surgery by our cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Yahya, and our anesthetist, Dr. Katirisen. And this was followed by a, limb, a bloodless limb amputation by Dr. Charles David in 2004, a bloodless scoliosis correction surgery by Dr. Ahmad Hatta. And here is where he used uh, the cell saver. And in 2007, bloodless aortic valve surgery by our uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Pao who optimize patients preoperatively and use meticulous surgical skills as well as techniques to reduce intraoperative blood loss. What all these um, surgeries had in common was they were all performed on patients who were Jehovah Witness. Yeah? Um, however, this approach was not offered to patients who were not Jehovah Witness. And in 2012, um, we were seeing a lot of unnecessary blood transfusions in our hospitals. Pa uh, surgeons were topping up um, um, patients with blood transfusion to bring up hemoglobin above, uh, hemoglobin above 10 prior to surgery and also in patients who were medically ill. So Dr. Asra, our hematopathologist and team, we started off the transfusion safety workshops. And here she is on... Uh, this is Dr. Astral. She's preparing fake blood um, for the workshops. And this is one of the workshops, one of the sessions showing you a patient receiving blood transfusion for epistaxis. Yep. And this is to, to educate um, doctors um, not to um, transfuse blood inappropriately. Um, and in the same year, um, the first patient blood management symposium was uh, held and that was uh, led by Dr. Ananti and Dr. Pao and team in collaboration with National Heart Centre, National Blood Centre and with SABEM. And I was not uh, aware of PBM at that time, but in, and, and this was, is a picture to show you the, the first PBM symposium. And I think you all recognize Prof. Dr. Pao, I think that's James Reynolds and Dr. Lee. Um, and in 2013, I was introduced to patient blood management by the Joa Witness uh, Hospital Liaison Committee, who was headed by Mr. Stephen Siever. Yes. He actually um, was giving a talk in the university where my husband was working. And so my husband asked him to, to approach me in Hospital Ampang. So here he is. Dr. Uh, Mr. Stephen Siva in one of our workshops. So I invited him to over to our transfusion safety workshops and he actually showed us a video on Dr. Dental Cooley on, and we were all hooked. Yep, we were all hooked on this new approach of patient blood management. 
So in 2014, we transformed our transfusion safety workshops to patient blood management workshops um, with our team of um, yeah, enthusiastic um, um, clinicians and even nurses. Yeah, we, uh, produce, we developed our own local PBM modules. There were seven modules. And here are pictures on the side here showing um, um, a station show, um, showing how the the cell saver is used, and also over here how uh, what uh, why we should not transfuse uh, um, blood to our patients, and we talk about all the dangers of blood transfusion. So we have these workshops every two to three monthly. We invite participants from uh, from each hospital, and they all have to send a team from each discipline, nurses, doctors, blood bank staff, and we had it regularly right up to 2019, end of 2019, and we actually managed to, to educate all hospitals throughout Malaysia on patient blood management. In 2015, uh, Dr. Carol Lim she uh, she came to our one hour workshop and she was so inspired that she went on to do um, workshops focused on obstetrics because she's an obstetrician nationwide. And here are some pictures to show you um, how we carry on our workshops. So our workshops is the first day is um, education uh, is a talks and then the second day we have hands on um, uh, workstations, yeah. as you can see in the picture here. Also in the same year. Through our connections uh, with Dr. Ananti. I met Dr. Ananti also in 2014, and she was instrumental in yeah, uh, connecting with other societies. And so um, we, we then joined ASPBM, which was formed in 2015. And we, uh, in 2017, uh, we co-hosted the third ASPBM symposium. And as you can see here, I think you can recognize some of the face here. There's Prof. Shender at the back here. Reynolds, um, Prof. Al, yeah, Kim here, yeah, Lee, Dr. Pao is here. And this is Dr. Carol. And in 2019, yeah, uh, um, yep, together with uh, clinicians who were passionate uh, on patient blood management, we officially form our society. Um, and this is our logo here, um, showing you a patient, yeah, and the three pillars of patient blood management. And this is a drop of the patient's own blood and how we could optimize the patient program such that they have improved patient outcomes. Dr. Anti was the honor honorary secretary and I am the president of the Malaysian Society of Patient Blood Management. And we work hard to develop our PBM guidelines. And here are some of our guidelines. And in we, we also um, wrote a 28-page proposal on implementation of PBM in hospitals throughout Malaysia to the Ministry of Health. Then come 2020, that as you all know, it's COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we moved our education, blood, bloodless medicine education to online, to virtual. And I'm just going to show you what we have, uh, what we have uh, um, carried out. This is a webinar to the public. We talked about, um, you know, um, we had a theme called Love Your Blood. And we talked about what is my hemoglobin? Yep. What is iron deficiency and what are my rights? Yeah, this is for the public. And here are all the participants. Um, we had a good turnout. More About, about 200 people attended our our workshop and and we had many questions and that was it was actually very wonderful and also we had webinars um, to healthcare providers where we talked about perioperative patient blood management yeah and we also invited um, international speakers you can see here Nathan Dr Nathaniel is here Dr Lara yep and we talked about preoperative intraoperative and we yet, we've yet to do the post-operative patient blood management. Um, we also went on to develop pamphlets, patient education pamphlets on anemia and patient blood management. And this is in English. And we have also come up with the Malay version. And I hope probably we will also come up with the Mandarin version. 
Um, these are education pamphlets for healthcare providers on perioperative patient blood management. Yep. And we came up with posters as well. And we plan to um, print all these uh, pamphlets and posters. And once we get all these versions sorted out and send it to all hospitals throughout Malaysia. And in August 2021, we had a, a virtual um, meeting um, for the Malaysian Society of Hemato Hematology and we part participated with a virtual booth and we had a lot of uh, uh, clinicians asking about patient blood management and I talked on saving dollars with cents, mainly particularly how we can save, um, you know, uh, save by, by not transfusing blood, transfusing blood inappropriately. And we also came out in the news, this is a, uh, 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 the journey of patient blood management, an article written by Dr. Ananti. This journal is read by doctors throughout Malaysia. And we also went live yep, on TV and on air. And here you can see Prof. Shanda and Frostler talking um, during the, um, the first, actually, the first um, live um, airing of patient blood management. Yep. Uh, and then that was that. And that led to more um, talks on patient blood management by our team. And I, I was talking here in, in Malay, in a Malay um, um, TV show. And he, this is Dr. Mandy. She's talking in Mandarin. And again, here's Dr. Ananti. So we, we got a lot of calls from public yeah, wanting to know about patient blood management. So we reached out to a lot of people, yeah, to the public. We also um, had uh, uh, several grants from stakeholders and, and we actually went on to do, got uh, a professional um, company to help us do educational videos. So we made five educational videos. Now, all this can be uh, um, seen on YouTube and we also have it on our website. What is patient blood management? The dangers of blood transfusion, on a video on perioperative patient blood management, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, and iron deficiency anemia in children and pregnant women. So I ask all of you to go to our website, yep, on www.pbmshare.com, and all these uh, videos and pamphlets are can be downloadable from our website. And we also had a Facebook Live public forum just recently in July 2022. And also, um, we could target a lot of um, uh, audience out there wanting to know about patient blood management. And we had actually talked about precious, precious blood of mine, also PBM. And this can be also be uh, um, um, seen on our website. We've also uh, invited ourselves to talk on patient blood management to uh, specialist trainees and medical students in various universities. And Dr. Ananti had come up with a CME module and patient blood management, and you can get CPD points yeah, on the MEMS website. And um, lastly, we had actually um, collaborated with MEMS and, uh, uh, and with the Ministry of Health to come up with the iron deficiency clinical practice guidelines and this will be starting off very soon and we hope to develop and finish this guideline by 2024. We also did a survey in 2017 to see uh, uh, the response from clinicians yeah, about their knowledge on patient blood management. We have more than 1,000 uh, participants who answered the, the survey and we asked them, one of the questions we asked them was, I would allow my patient to undergo a major elective surgery with hemoglobin of 10. 82% uh, said they would allow, yeah. And, and so, you know, we've, we've started our patient blood man uh, management education since 2014 and we still, you know, have a long way to go. And in 2021, we again asked the question in a, in a different format, but we asked the question, Anemia is a contraindication to elective surgery, and we have 41% saying true, it is a contraindication to surgery. So we have improved by 40%. Yeah? 
and hopefully we can improve that further. So this is the proposal that we um, presented to the Ministry of Health yeah, um, on implementing patient blood management in hospitals across Malaysia and we asked um, to the Ministry of Health to form a, a committee and to make PBM a standard and requirement for all hospital. Yep, so we had this uh, call to action to the Ministry of Health. They took it very well, yep, but however, the, this was presented in 2019, COVID pandemic came about and so all this was stalled. So in early this year, I revisited um, PBM to the Ministry of Health and in March 2022, they formed the PBM, the National PBM Committee and they had their first National PBM Consensus Meeting on 16 um, to the 18 August to come up with a, a module on patient blood management. So um, it, it, we started off yeah, very, very slow, snail pace yep, yeah, from 1994 to 2019. We were, not, we, we were seeing some progress, but not much. But I hope with the, uh, the formation of the National PBM um, Committee, we hope to see a giant leap forward. And I hope by 2024, we would have the PBM consensus up and running the iron deficiency clinical practice guideline completed and i hope by then the ministry of health would direct all hospitals and clinics to implement patient blood management i ho also hope to see more bloodless surgeries in non-jehovah witness patients the use of iv iron and erythropoietin uh, uh, use data collection we should collect our data and we should have more pbm audits and by by having data we will then have more clinical research, looking at patient outcomes and a re reduction of transfusions and, and its cost savings. And I hope by 2030, we'll have PBM practice in all hospitals throughout Malaysia. I think that could be a reality if we all work together yeah, and continue with bloodless med uh, medicine education and not to stop. Yeah? So there are many challenges. This lack of awareness among our, our healthcare providers, yep, our patients as well. Current practice is deeply ingrained. So it's quite difficult to change, but we will persevere. There's lack of champions, lack of interactions and communications within one another between disciplines, and of course, lack of data. So to overcome these challenges, we need to increase our awareness on PBM, we need to have this bloodless medicine education continuously. We need to work together. Everyone can be a champion. And we hope that the Ministry of Health would, would um, direct all hospitals to implement PBM throughout the hospitals and to do audits. And we need to collect, have a, a registry to collect data. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions at the end of my talk.